Self new to deep learning. Okay, quite a lot of people. <laughs> All right, uh, how many think that you're super experts or researchers? Okay, a few. And intermediates? All right, another few. Okay, so the fact that there's quite a lot of beginners in the room, I, how many of you have actually heard of a GAN or a general adversarial network? How many of you have built a GAN? A lot less hands. All right. Um, okay, so tonight I'm going to be talking about GANs. I, and hopefully by the end of the night, you'll be able to go home and at least build uh, some simple GANs to get started. Um, so my, na my name is Sam. Uh, I'm a Google developer expert for machine learning. I, and tonight I'm going to be talking about, uh, since, since it's quite a beginner's audience, I will sort of approach the topic from this from a little bit more simple sort of explanation. Um, and we're going to be talking about general adversarial networks. So first of all, what is a general adversarial network? I, so Jan LeCun, who's uh, head of Facebook AI research, uh, described it as the most interesting idea in the last 10 years. I, and you can see that one of the big things, just like we saw in the previous talk, uh, is this whole concept of when you don't have enough data, being able to manufacture data by using the data that you already have. And this is what GANs do. And basically the key thing with a GAN is that it learns to look at a, a, a distribution, a probability distribution in a different way than we normally would with say a classifier or something else in deep learning. When we're just trying to predict a classification or something like that, we're much more interested then of just getting it right. right? We don't really care that we get the actual distribution right in that sense. Whereas with GANs, we're much more interested in being able to reproduce a distribution. And you can see that if you look at some uh, examples here, we've got a whole bunch of you know, training examples. And then we want to be able to reproduce images that are similar to these images, but are not going to be exactly the same images. So we're building generative networks. You can think about uh, supervised learning. Right, as basically sort of you know, creating, uh, you know, all sort of deep learning is basically uh, f of x equals y, all right? So a function with our data in it will produce some sort of y as an output. All right? You can also think about it as a, as a probability of, you know, the probability of y given x with our x being our input data in that sort of sense. And this is very sort of standard machine learning stuff for, you know, especially even for, for deep learning classification. When we, talk about, uh, when we talk about general adversarial networks, though, we're looking for different things. We're looking for basically reproduction. And a good example of this is where sort of this whole f of x sort of thing tends to fall down is that often what it does is it sort of produces a mean. Now, if you think about it, if I have a, a pen and I hold the pen up here and I balance it nicely, What's the probability that it's going to fall to any point when it falls down? Or what would be the f of x of that if you were predicting the probability of where it's going to fall? Really, what sort of general machine learning would do would predict the mean, which would basically be sort of like particles spread right around the 360 degrees, but the actual pen wouldn't be in any one place. So this is where GANs are different. GAN doesn't want to do that. What it, wants, what it wants to do is to be able to show you, here is a real example of how, say, the pen would fall, and you would see the whole pen in one particular location. All right. So a good example of this, and one of the first sort of uh, papers you know, with GANs showed was this whole concept, is that when we're trying to predict the next frame of a video, using sort of traditional uh, ways of making a prediction, we don't get very good results. We get sort of this mean concept. And if you look at here, we can see that like on the left, we've got the, the ground truth of what the next, next frame was. In the middle, we've got this mean squared error sort of thing. And you notice that the ear is all blurred. I, and it's, just, it's really not good at being able to predict what an image is going to look like. Whereas an adversarial model can actually predict a distribution that for, is going to be specifically true for one instance in that, that, you know, in that sort of uh, distribution model. And th this is what the whole sort of concept of GANs is about. 
I, so they were originally introduced uh, in 2014 by uh, Ian Goodfellow, uh, who's now a researcher at Google Brain. It, it took off a lot in sort of 2016 and also you know, 2017. I actually gave a talk about GANs about a year ago here at Google. At that stage, it, you know, a lot of this stuff was still very new. Um, and certainly in the past you know, year and a half to two years, we've seen lots of types of GANs, lots of variations of GANs. I, we've got you know, the DC GAN, which is, I think, what, I, what, they were, what you were using to make the eyes and stuff like that. Um, we've got a Wasserstein GAN, which is basically some tricks for training GANs better. We've got uh, things like Stack GAN, where we can basically I, take an embedding of text Say we take a, an embedding of something that's text of, uh, and then we can use that text as an input to basically predict an image. So we can do things like, if you, and you've probably seen this in the news last year or the year before, of things like being able to type into an algorithm, uh, it's, a red, uh, it's a red bird with a yellow chest. And the, the model is actually able to make a, an image of a red bird with yellow chest. Right, so it's basically there. What it's doing is taking uh, an embedding and converting it, that into the GAN, and then predicting the the actual sort of instance of that. Um, there's lots of good, you know, GANs. One of the best ones that probably came out just at the end of last year was the thing called the progressively growing GAN, which really sort of uh, achieved a lot of good things in doing things with really big images, uh, and it's probably one of the most sort of accurate GANs uh, t to date. So what is a GAN? I, if you're new to you know, machine, if you're new to deep learning, you, you probably don't understand you know, what this concept of this GAN. But it actually, it's very simple. It's basically a model where we have two separate models fighting against each other. And you can think of it, often people talk about it as, uh, as sort of like counterfeiting money. So you have the counterfeiter, and then you have the police. So the counterfeiter's job is what we call a generative model, is to come up with new versions of counterfeit money, right? The police job is a, is a discriminator. So the police is basically there to check and say, this is real money or this is fake money, right? And here's the thing, the whole reason why this works, and just showing you like where we call it a generator and discriminator, the whole reason why this works is that as, as, the, you know, as these two parts of the model train, they get better and they get better at producing it. So if you think about it if, if with the analogy of counterfeiting, as the counterfeiters start to get better at making counterfeit money, the police have to get better at detecting it. And as the police get better at detecting it, the counterfeiters have to get better at counterfeiting it. And the ideal sort of solution is you get to a point where you've got these two, you know, these two networks fighting it out, and they're trying to, to sort of, you know, both, both networks are, or both parts of the model are trying to win. And the ideal situ situation is basically an equilibrium where it becomes sort of like a flip of the coin of whether this thing is real and comes from a real distribution or whether it's faked and comes from the generator. And you don't, you, you know, so the, the whole thing with, with GANs is we want to balance that. I, and it's what, you know, for, for those of you who know a little bit more, it's what we call a minimax game. Right? where we're basically trying to optimize. And if you, this is a good example of what we're trying to do is we're trying to optimize this saddle point. And we want to be right on that point of the saddle where it's sort of 0.5, where basically we've got our generator being able to fool the discriminator 50% of the time and the discriminator being able to detect the, the fake copies 50% of the time. So that, that's the ideal. Now, obviously, uh, when we're training them, we don't always get the ideal, right? Uh, and one of the big problems at the, early on was this whole, you know, that it's very hard to do. You can sort of see that what we're trying to do is basically make loss functions that sort of situate and balance the loss of two networks. If either part of the network becomes too strong, it will just dominate and it will take over the other part. So for example, if you've got a bad discriminator, you've got a bad policeman, he'll let all the counterfeit you know, stuff through no matter how good it is. If you've got a really strong policeman and no, not a good counterfeiter, then nothing will ever get through. And therefore your generator will never get good at actually making, you know, new images. So we talk about this sort of concept of adversarial loss. 
I, and the thing to think about here is just really that it's basically uh, a loss on the sort of two predictions. One where, one where we're trying to, to, one side is trying to minimize the loss, right? Obviously the discriminator. And then the generator is trying to maximize that loss by fooling the discriminator. So this is, a, this is a, an image from Ian Goodfellow that basically sort of shows uh, exactly how the, the network works. We put in some basically some sample data. Uh, so basically we just put in some noise to kickstart it. And then the model will take that noise and reshape it into an example. And here's the thing is sometimes we give the discriminator real images and sometimes we give it images that are made by the generator. And it has to determine which ones are real and which ones are fake. So if it says that the, the real image is a fake, it gets penalized, right? If it, you know, and, and vice versa, right? If the, if the generator is basically not producing something that's convincing enough, it, all, you know, it also gets penalized. So this is, this is where we're trying to get to this equilibrium, this whole sort of uh, equilibrium that's going on here. So, the beginning, the, the sort of the first one, and what nowadays is really called the vanilla GAN, um, it just basically uses this very simple concept that basically we put, put some latent noise, which we call Z, into a generator, which we, we call G. I, we also then take some real data and stick that in. I, and then we sort of randomly present these to a discriminator who has to decide are they real or fake. And then we basically use that to basically score our loss and update our weights to, be, to get the model better at being able to take that noise and, and be able to reproduce images. So really the big thing to understand here though is what we're most concerned about is the generator. Well, you know, actually, sometimes we want to use the discriminator too, but the generator generally is the one that we're you know, most concerned about because ideally what we want is we eventually want to be able to just take the generator as a module, snap it off, and then just say, right, make me 100,000 eye pictures, like for, for the previous problem. Uh, and have it be able to produce enough images that are, are realistic from the, and have the same sort of probability distribution as a real set of you know, eye images. I, there are times too that you want to actually use this to, to create better discriminators for certain things too. You know, that, that is possible. <coughs> okay, so we basically take the generative loss and the discriminative loss, we add those together, and that's our total loss of the network. Uh, obviously, you know, the, I, we flip the generator's loss because the generator is actually trying to push the loss up. So we basically you know, flip that and then we, we get a total loss and we then use that. But here's the thing, in, uh, in GANs, we, we don't think about losses in the same ways that we do in say when we're training a classifier or something like that. Uh, you'll find that often the loss when you're training a GAN really doesn't have a lot of meaning. Uh, so people you know, will, will think that, okay, well, if I, oh, my, my loss is you know, not going well or something. You wanna make sure that the losses are being balanced. That's the key thing to happen here. Okay, so uh, let's jump in some, some code. I'm gonna show you a sort of more advanced way of how to do GANs, and then I'm gonna show you an easy way to how to do GANs. So this is a, a data set that is called the Quick Draw data set. Um, how many have played with the app Quick Draw? All right. If you haven't, go and check it out. It's a very cool little uh, Google Apps, quite old now. Right. But basically what it does is, is you draw something and the algorithm keeps trying to guess what you're drawing. Uh, and it's got, I think, about 100 different things you can draw or 80 things. How many things it is? I've forgotten now, exactly. But um, Google often uses this at road shows where they have it on a big touch TV and people will draw on the touch TV. Uh, to do it. And it's a fun game. It basically will start guessing. Uh, you know, it, it sort of looks at what you're doing and then runs it through a model and then tries to make a prediction. Now here's the thing, is that Google, every time someone's drawn something in, whether you've done it on the mobile version or whether you've done it on a version of a roadshow, Google's kept your pictures. So just like Shupa was saying that people are trying to evil, trying to steal your data, well the data of how you draw a bicycle, you know, <laughs> has been kept. And the quick draw data set, which Google has now released for research, um, is really cool because it has 50 million draw hand, hand drawings. And they're, they're over, you know, I think it's about 100 classes or something like that. 
I, and it is a really interesting data set because people draw things different around the world. For example, there's, some, you know, there's a, a blog post about this. So I don't have it in here, but if you do a search for it and do it, there's a great blog post from Google about it showing that, for example, in Russia, people draw chairs differently than they do in other parts of the world or something like that. Or in South Korea, they draw you know, whatever it is different than other places. So it is kind of interesting to just sort of see that. But it also makes a really nice data set for us to train and train up again to do this. And the particular type of GAN that, I'm gonna tr that I trained up for this uh, is a conditional GAN. So the difference a little bit, uh, let me explain the difference between a vanilla GAN and a uh, conditional GAN. So everything's the same. Actually, we have noise going into the generator, even though I'm not, I'm not showing it here. The thing that's different is we also pass in some labels. So now the GAN is not just saying, OK, I can produce an image from all these images that it's, it's doing. It's actually producing a bike image or a you know, angel image or a bee image or some, you know, some particular image from that data set. Right? And the way we do this is we pass basically the labels into the generator. So it sort of get, it learns to use the weights differently that, OK, so if it's, if it's generating a uh, a bike, or if we're using MNIST, which we'll use later on, if it's generating a number one, it uses the weights in this way. If it's generating a number seven, it uses them in slightly different. And it learns to be able to then be able to reproduce multiple things. And you can actually then tell it, okay, produce me 100,000 I, you know, 100,000 ones or 100,000 sevens, and it will be able to do that. Okay, so let's look at some uh, old code for doing this. And this is I don't know if this is if old is the right way of saying it, but uh, where, where is it? Okay, so for start, you will see this is a lot of code, right? Um, and one of the reasons is okay. So we we've got you know our normal things of where we're inputting data. I, so this is an example of a bicycle that someone's drawn. And you can, you can imagine that people draw bicycles very differently, right? <laughs> Would you have drawn a bicycle exactly the same way as this? Th this is one of the reasons why I chose this data set, is because it is kind of an interesting data set where it is very different, right? With MNIST, it, it, uh, people draw numbers differently, but certainly not as differently as they draw bees or basketballs or brains or you know, all these sorts of things. Um, so we're basically just going to use a few conditions in here. I've, import, I've brought in, uh, how many did I choose to bring in? 40,000 of each of these things. So it's basically reading in 40,000 bicycles, 40,000 angels, 40,000 bananas, 40,000 brains, 40,000 bees. All right. And, oh, you can't see. I can see. Thank you, Manny, for pointing out. Is that getting bigger? Okay, how's that? Okay, so I so you can see basically I'm just bringing them in from NumPy. I uh, Google's got like I said, there's this whole data set you can download yourself. Whoa, that's going a bit over. I and for each, I think the data set is how many? How, it's like 11 gig or 12 gig of of data. It's not a small data set by any means. There's some serious lag on this, which I'm not sure why.
Okay. Why is Jupiter lagging so much on... So, all right, I, I'm just going to leave it at this size for now. Let me try and go in a little bit. So basically, we're just bringing in uh, five classes. I'm just assigning them some labels and stuff like that. I, and then what we're going to do is basically build a model, and you can see here I'm building a full-on model. I'm having to basically write out the code uh, for all the different, uh, the different loss functions that are going on. I, I have to basically set TensorFlow that at certain times I want to turn uh, variables on to be able to change the gradients. At certain times I don't want to be able to do that. Um, the key point here is that this is a lot of code, right? I, just to show you some of the some of the images that come out though when we train this code we can see that this is what the model starts off you know the generator is starting off like this it really has no clue about how to produce any of these things i But gradually over time, it starts to learn. And we can start to see that, OK, remember we've got like a bicycle, a banana, an angel. I, and we can see that as, as we go on, it's starting to basically learn how to produce different types, of anim, uh, different types of things. So we can see here that we're now probably getting some of the bananas. We've got some down here that are maybe like the, the angels. I, up here, we've got a bee, I think. I, Anyway, then if we basically train this for a long, long time, and I'm printing out every about 100 steps or so, and by the end, we've actually got a model that has the ability, the generator has the ability to produce these handwritten, uh, sort of hand-drawn you know, uh, figures quite well, right? We've got, clearly got some sort of you know, things that are like a bicycle. I, we've got our bananas. We've got our bee. We can see that this is like the wings of an angel or something. I, and it's basically producing these I, in that way. The problem is, though, I, to be able to do it, you have to write a lot of code. And so one of the key things that Google did recently I, in December was basically release a library called TFGAN. And what TFGAN does is basically makes sort of building basic GANs and training them a lot easier. And I will, you know, I'll leave. I'll put this link up later on for you to be able to read the the, the post. But let's sort of jump in uh, and look at the same sort of conditional GAN with using TFGAN, right? So we're trying to do the same sort of thing. We're doing it on MNIST this time instead of uh, the quick draw. But basically, we do our imports. Uh, we've got a couple of helper functions just to be able to print out images and stuff like that. We load our data. As you can see, everyone knows what MNIST is, yes? Uh, it's basically handwritten digits, one, you know, 0 through 9. I, and then basically we make, our mo we make our models. So we basically make a generator and we make it a discriminator. Right? 
And here it's using, uh, for me, the biggest downfall of all of this is that it's using uh, an old TensorFlow library called TensorFlow Slim, right? I, but that may change. Who knows? Let's see. I, basically, you make your models. I, we've got our uh, conditional generator here. And you can see the conditional generator, we're passing in inputs where we're basically passing in some noise, that latent Z, uh, the, the latent Z matrix or vector that we had before. And we're also passing in uh, a one-hot encoded labels for MNIST in this case. So that the generator knows what it's actually making. Right. Then we've got our discriminator, which basically uh, its whole job is to basically detect what's real, what's not. Right. And you see that here we've, our, our model is much simpler than the code that I showed you before. All right? So for those of you who were in you know, the deep learning developer course, we went through all of that code line by line and, and talked about it, et cetera, and stuff like that. All right, with TFGAN, it's much simpler. <clears throat> and the cool thing is then we can come in and we can basically then assemble our model and say, right, we're going to make a TFGAN model. Our generator function is going to be this generator that we defined up up above, our conditional function or discriminator is going to be what we defined up there. We're going to pass in some data, and we're going to pass in some noise. And then I, we can basically tell it, OK, well, here's the loss functions I want you to use. Again, now, and this is one of the cool things with TFGAN. TFGAN basically has all the loss functions made for you. So you don't have to go through and, and code them. It also has optimizers, everything done for you in that sense. I, then basically we want to actually sort of get the, the model ready for training. We basically just say, right, we're going to pass in our conditional GAN model. We're going to use these GAN losses that we defined up here. I, we're going to basically pass in our you know, optimizers for our generator, that. And then we basically train it. And then we can just train it, and it will go. And it will basically go through. And here I've, I've basically trained it this afternoon on a GPU. And you can see that gradually over time, it's starting to learn the numbers. And it's able to produce these numbers uh, in a very, you know, certainly by the end, uh, in fact, even by halfway through the training, MNIST is not that hard to produce. Certainly a lot easier than quick draw to produce. Um, and it, you can see that by here, we're actually able to produce real MNIST digits uh, that are not actually digits that were given to the model. Right? This is, these are digits that it's made up by itself. I, let me come back to what I was going to show you here. So what is TFGAN? TFGAN is basically a lightweight library for GANs in TensorFlow. Right? It has like sets of pre-made losses and GAN components. So all the things that were kind of like the pain in the butt things to do with a lot of things with GANs, uh, you can basically just take all these off-the-shelf losses and stuff that are built for you, and then you can just you know, put it into a model. It's, in, it's a much simpler way to be able to make a GAN. I, another thing, which I'll show you in a second, is you can also then make a GAN, in, an estimated GAN. So you, hear it, Martin, you heard Martin talking about estimators early on. I, for those of you who have been around in TensorFlow for a, a, you know, quite a while, estimators are... are something that really has only taken off in the past sort of two, ver two three versions of, of TensorFlow. One of the big reasons why TensorFlow uh, estimators are important is that I, TensorFlow estimators take all the, the details in regards to distributed training, training on TPUs, all that sort of stuff, and just automate it, it, automates it for you. So if you've got a model that's basically an estimator, you can train it on a TPU. If the, the model that I showed you before with the train loop in Python and stuff like that, that won't train on a TPU, right? So estimators gradually are becoming more and more important, especially you know, if you have any sort of uh, ambitions to use you know, uh, Google Cloud or distributed learning and stuff like that with TensorFlow. Um, so why, why TFGAN? I think I've covered most of these things already, right? It's basically, I, it's very easy to get started and sort of check out how GANs work get a good understanding of them and that kind of thing. Um, let me just show you another one quickly, which is this one. So this is a vanilla GAN, but this is basically doing it as a GAN estimator. So estimators have a few key you know, functions. We basically have the model function. We have the input functions. 
All right. Uh, then we have generally we have some sort of evaluation function, which is uh, which the estimator takes care of this for us. So here, basically, I'm I'm defining. Uh, I've got my helper functions, which are basically just for plotting things out. I'm loading my data exactly the same as I did before. I've got my data input pipeline. So basically, here's my pipeline for basically pulling the data into the uh, in a format that is sort of estimator friendly. Then for the model. Here's my, again, here's my generator and discriminator, very similar to what you saw before. I, and then for the model, I can basically just take it and, and I build this estimator. I basically just say tfgan.estimator, GAN estimator, and then I tell it, right, for the, the generator function, use this. For the discriminator function, use this. For the generator loss function, use this. And here's the cool thing, I'll show you, uh, I'll just uncomment this to show you. So. One of the biggest things that's changed in GANs over time, and one of the things that, that sort of improved GANs is different sorts of loss functions, different ways of dealing with these sorts of things. And TFGAN has a lot of these built in. So for example, these losses, I can, let's see if I can, whoa, why is that not working? Uh, why is autocomplete not working? Okay, basically, I, this is what's going on here, and I, I, you can, I'll put this notebook up, you can play with it yourself, is basically what's going on is you can pick what losses you want, and it's literally now, you just pick off-the-shelf losses. So if you wanted to try building your GAN for your eyes, and you wanted to see what works best, you would just run it through a few different times with different types of losses, and see which, which works the best. Um, something like the Wasserstein, Wasserstein generators, you know, these sort of losses, uh, we're not easy to code. So the fact that it's all done for you is, you know, basically just take it, use it off the shelf. Um, we then put in our optimizers. Uh, you can see I'm just using basically Atom there. Uh, and then we can set things like whether we want to show it on, on TensorBoard or something like that. Then literally we just train it, just like we do any other estimator. Uh, and we can run the, uh, an evaluation and then we can print some out. And we can see that, yes, this is also, you know, in quite a quick time, is also pr producing MNIST digits quite well. Okay, very quickly to finish up. I, so the challenges with TFGAN is it's heavily reliant on TFSLIM, which I kind of hate. Um, partly because we've been told that SLIM is supposed to be deprecated from TensorFlow at some point. I, the other thing, too, is that this kind of thing will work for a certain number of GANs, but if you get off the main path too much, it won't work, right? They, like, I, it, it has its limitations, but certainly for people starting out who are new to GANs and just want to be able to say, oh yeah, I've, I've built a GAN, I checked it out, I got an understanding of what it's like, that kind of thing, um, it's worth trying. I, GANs themselves basically have a lot of advantages. It's, it's one of the most interesting areas of deep learning that's going on at the moment. I, there's still a long way to go. I, it, so, so far, they haven't been used for, for a lot of real-world functions. They have been used for some, but certainly not as many as maybe we would hope. Uh, and I think that will change this year. I think we'll, this year we'll definitely see a lot of things happen with GANs, uh, perhaps related to medical imaging, related to a lot more sort of detailed imaging. Um, things like the progressively going GAN has shown that you can build GANs that have unbelievably high-resolution images. Uh, and produce them really well. All right. Some problems, other problems with, with GANs and with some of the typical GANs, if you go and build some of these yourself, is that <coughs> they have a problem with counting. <laughs> As you can see, these are some of the images um, taken from uh, in Goodfellow's uh, early GANs, and they, they often will sort of produce animals which look kind of like animals, but maybe not exactly right. Um, they also have problems with perspective. Uh, now, a lot of these issues have been solved in some of the newer GANs, right? Uh, that's, that's sort of like, you know, the I, other things. I'm not going to go through the, the sort of more advanced stuff of problems of GANs and stuff like that. If you are training GANs and you have questions, feel free to, you know, I can go into depth later on. Same with t tips and tricks. There's a lot of tips and tricks uh, to do with things like label smoothing, uh, batch normalization, virtual batch normalization, unequal training, where you don't always train the discriminator and generator at the same amount. You sometimes train the generator twice as much as the discriminator. 
Um, there's a bunch of different tricks that you sort of learn to be able to get good at them. I, for evaluating GANs, like I said before, we don't really evaluate them just on the, what's the lowest loss because that doesn't really mean anything. We're trying to make images that humans think are real. I, so often what we use is what's called an inception score, which is basically running it through, uh, like a, for example, it, the inception model trained on ImageNet, and we, we're looking for a very low entropy I, result from that. So basically we wanted to say that, okay, I think this is a hot dog, right? Or I think this is a cat, or I think this is a, you know, and, and it to be very certain about that. Not saying, well, I think it's half a cat and half a dog, right? That means our, probably our image is not that great. Um, one of the, the GANs that I love a lot, I showed this at, Pi, at the PyTorch talks, I, is CycleGAN. I, CycleGAN, I don't think can be done with TFGAN, unfortunately. I, and CycleGAN, basically, what you're learning to do is train, I, train things on, I, on what we call unpaired images. So there are a lot of models which are called the pix to pix models out there. That basically, if you see over on the left here, we've got a drawing of a shoe, and then the model will pre produce an actual shoe that looks like that. I, what the unpaired image, you know, and that's great if you've got like a, a, a sort of a, a before and after, right, that are exactly the same, then, then it's great. Those models are fantastic, you can do a lot with them. The problem is a lot of times you don't have that kind of data, right? I, especially if you're doing something like this. And this is uh, a, a cycle GAN that I trained up to basically look at an image and look at the image whether it's in spring or winter and then change it to be the opposite. So you can see that on the left here at the top, it's got an image which is spring. And then the model has learned to be able to turn that into winter. And you can see the, the picture on the right is actually the fake picture. Which is pretty good, right? It looks pretty realistic in that sense. Um, the, again, the same with the bottom. We've got one, I, you know, one winter, one, one spring. Uh, here are some more. Here are some ones that didn't work out as well. And you can see that, for example, this is where it's taking uh, on the, the top left there. It's trying to turn that winter picture into uh, spring, but it doesn't really know what to do when you take the snow away. Now, here's the thing is that this model has actually, we haven't told it what snow is. There's nothing like that. It's basically just learned through looking at a lot of pictures of spring and a lot of pictures of winter that there are things in, that are in common in these pictures and how could you sort of change from one to the other. The way, one of the ways, sort of a very simple description of how CycleGAM works is that it basically says, right, this is a picture of spring. Let me make a picture of a winter and then let me convert it back from a picture of winter to spring and compare it against my original picture. Does that make sense? Right? So it's a very cool trick. And it's a trick that we'll see a lot more this year it, with things to do with text, to do with a lot of things that, you know, that you're going to see AI things happen. Um, I, but the thing is, it, you know, it doesn't always work. right? And it certainly takes a lot of training. Um, I did see a really nice example of, of this where uh, someone who was making a home video took basically a video of the front of their car driving down their neighborhood, and then they were able to turn their neighborhood into like a winter scene. And it looked impressive enough that you could probably get away with it, you know, in a movie or something like that. Um, um, here's what happens when you take MBS and you try and turn it into winter. Now the training set here had no, uh, the training set had no buildings in it at all. So it shouldn't work at all, right? I, Really what I should have done if I wanted to do this was take pictures of buildings with snow and buildings without snow and then try and do it that way. Um, but it does produce some pretty interesting images, right? So I, I like to call these the sort of nuclear winter or, you know, MBS in sort of like the end of days time or something like that. Um, another thing you can do is basically take, uh, and the, this thing that this, this paper became very famous for was taking horses and turning them into zebras and zebras and turning them into horses. I, so you can see here I've taken two pictures of horses uh, and turned them into sort of zombie zebras. And it sort of learnt, you know, roughly what the lines were doing. Now, I, this was after a day of training on a very, uh, sorry, day and a half of training on a very fast GPU. So it does take a lot of time to do this sort of thing. But anyway, th this is sort of what GANs are. I, I would encourage you to sort of learn them. They're not, uh, you know, a lot of people find them very intimidating. 
I, but it's something that once you, you sort of get the handle of, you can actually build some really cool things with them. If you are looking for doing you know, data augmentation or increasing your data sets or something, they're always worth trying. Any questions? I'm happy to take questions. Or if people just want to come up and ask questions, I'm also happy to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.